Well, uh, thank you, Chris. It's great to be here at UD, and I'm honored to, uh, to give this inaugural lecture um, on love and marriage. So from Hollywood to the halls of academe, we often hear the message um, that marriage and a strong marriage culture doesn't matter. Kids were told need not enjoy the shelter and security of a married home to thrive. Take, for instance, Jennifer Aniston saying, um, quote, women are realizing it more and more, knowing that they don't have to settle with a man just to have that child. And she said this in connection with a movie that she was starring at the time that was featuring a woman having a kid with a sperm donor. Or in her book on Maverick Moms, which celebrates women who are raising boys without men, Cornell psychologist Peggy Drexler claimed that, quote, women possess the innate mom power that in itself is more than sufficient to raise fine sons. This is just kind of giving you a, a sense of what we're hearing often, once again, in Hollywood and in academe. And of course, in the media, uh, this message is often taken up as well with the kind of Pollyannish family talk about the decline of marriage not being a problem for our day and our age. Just this last week, Matthew Iglesias at Fox contended the decline of marriage cannot be linked to any meaningful declines overall in the welfare of women and children in the US. These messages have not been lost in today's young adults. In fact, a large minority of, sorry, we also have seen um, another, I think, related point, and that comes from Stephanie Kuntz, a kind of noted historian of the family in the United States. And that is that basically, it's not just that marriage itself isn't necessarily all that important, it's that a kind of a strong marriage culture um, is no longer um, important. In fact, it's actually a good thing that the institution of marriage has become less universal and less stable. Because in her assessment, over the past century, marriage has steadily become more fair, more fulfilling, and more effective in fostering the well-being of adults. And her basic point here simply is that insofar as our society has made marriage a much more voluntary institution and given it less legal supports, people, in her view, are choosing to stay in marriages only so long as they provide a certain kind of fulfillment um, to the parties um, involved. And that, in her estimation, should lead to better uh, marriages. These messages have not been lost on today's young adults. In fact, a large minority of millennials believe that marriage is becoming obsolete and that a growing variety of family arrangements is a good thing. According to this recent Pew report, as you can see here, there's just a dramatic change over time in the direction of younger and younger generations taking a more laissez view uh, or libertarian view of family life. There's only one problem with this new view of marriage that we're seeing among the media, among scholars, among um, pop cultural icons, and among more and more young adults. It's not true. On average, men, women, and kids are more likely to flourish and to realize the American dream when marriage grounds adult intimacy and the rearing of the next generation. Marriage provides meaning, direction, purpose, and stability to our deepest needs for bonding and belonging. Moreover, as we'll see tonight, marriage offers one of the most durable paths to happiness in America, especially for those who embrace an ethic uh, of marital permanence. Now, before I begin um, tackling the heart of my talk, I want to just give you a quick sense of what's sort of happening um, demographically in America. Sort of what is the state, if you will, um, of our unions today in the United States. And what we can see is that there's been a, a dramatic shift in family life in the last four decades, a dramatic retreat from marriage in the last half century, with market increases in divorce, in cohabitation, and non-marital childbearing. What some people don't realize, though, is that this particular retreat has been per particularly um, consequential for working class and poor Americans. And this slide gives you a sense, first, of how it's affected kids. So back in 1960, you can see about 85 or 86 percent of people, of kids, were living with, their, uh, with both of their parents. 
Um, today it's about 70% uh, at any one point in time. When you look at kind of kids over the life course, we see is that over the life course, more than one in two kids will spend some time apart from their biological married parents uh, because of increases in family instability and single parenthood here uh, in the US. There's also a growing marriage divide where college educated Americans, uh, like many of you here, um, either are will be in a year, two, or three, um, are actually doing pretty well when it comes to marriage, um, enjoying fairly high quality marriages, fairly stable marriages. But less educated Americans are today less and less likely to form and sustain these high, high quality marriages, both for themselves um, and for their kids. This next slide gives you a sense of the difference um, by class or by education and divorce. We have highly educated Americans over here who have got a college degree, those who've got a high school degree or some college in the middle, and those who are high school dropouts over here on the left. And you can see, obviously, that those who are college educated are about a third less likely to get divorced uh, in America today. So that's a pretty striking pattern. But even, I think, more striking is the pattern we see in the next slide, where having a kid outside of marriage is still comparatively rare among college educated Americans but is becoming quite common, not just among high school dropouts, but also among Americans who have a high school degree or some college, this middle category. So there's a, a shift where this middle group is going from being more like this group in 1982 to more like this group um, in more recent years. So basically, beneath this college-educated strata, we're seeing um, a dramatic retreat from marriage uh, in America. And all this matters, in my estimation, because it affects our kids. What we can see here, basically, is that, once again, college-educated Americans are doing quite well in terms of maintaining stability uh, for their kids. The vast majority of their kids will be reared in a stable two-parent household. But there's been a dramatic decline in family stability uh, for kids in moderately educated homes and uh, less educated homes as well. So why is this? important. Why is it important that we're seeing more and more kids spending time in single parent families and step families and experiencing family instability? You know, one of the ideas that you hear in the academy sometimes is that the family is just changing. We're just seeing more and more family diversity. I think this view, though, doesn't really recognize um, the science. And the science on marriage and family is, is pretty clear. And let me also be clear in acknowledging that many kids who are raised in single parent families turn out just fine. I was raised by a single mother, and I think that both myself and my sister have turned out okay. <laughs> but there's also a, a risk factor. You basically double or triple the risk that your kids will experience serious negative outcomes, you know, like depression or delinquency or drug use um, when you are exposing them. Um, either voluntarily or involuntarily to single parenthood um, or some other kind of family uh, instability. So we know that in general, kids raised in single parent households are more likely to experience the kind of psychological outcomes, the social outcomes, and the economic outcomes that are mentioned here uh, in this slide. And then just to give you kind of a more concrete sense of what that looks like um, in ordinary life, when it comes to something like prison, for instance, we know that boys who are raised in a single mother household are more than twice as likely to end up in jail or in prison by the time they turn 30 compared to boys who are raised in an intact married family right here. So not having a father in the household to give them kind of a model of responsible masculinity, to monitor their friends, to be an authoritative voice for discipline in the home um, is a real problem. And it dramatically increases the risk, once again, the boys um, will end up in prison or jail um, because they don't have that strong um, male presence uh, in the home. But dads matter for daughters as well. And we can see in the research is that having a father in the home, uh, particularly an engaged and affectionate dad in the home, is quite protective when it comes to protecting teenage girls from the risk of having a teen pregnancy. So if you have a dad in the picture, who is watching out, once again, for your friends and even, obviously, boyfriends, who is uh, modeling a loving relationship with your mother, 
um, and it's treating you with respect and regard and affection. Um, if you're a teenage girl, you're much less likely to seek out the attentions of a young man or a teenage boy who doesn't necessarily have your own best interests um, at heart. And then we also see when it comes to sort of getting the human capital that you need to thrive in, in the today's contemporary marketplace, what you see here is that kids who are coming from intact families um, in the blue are both in better educated homes and less educated homes uh, more likely to go on today and get a college degree. So having, once again, two married parents um, for kids in a variety of different um, backgrounds um, are more likely to, uh, to thrive in our current educational um, climate. And this also extends, too, to their encounters in the workforce. We can see here that young adults, both men and women, um, are more likely to be working more hours, actually just working um, as young adults, if they're coming from a stably married family, compared to their peers who are coming from a step family um, here, and then the comparison group here is kids coming from a single parent family. So the point here simply is that marriage protects our kids um, from paths that aren't good for them, like prison or a teen pregnancy, and puts them on a path towards a success in school um, and in their professional lives uh, as well. Now, when you talk about the effect of family structure on kids, I think an obvious question that runs through people's minds is, well, yeah, in general this makes sense, but what about kids who are in homes where there's some kind of conflict or some kind of disagreement between the parents? And it is the case, in all honesty, the kids who are in a high conflict home tend to do better when their parents you know, separate, when they part ways. Um, but what people don't realize is that about two-thirds of divorces today involving kids involve kids where there isn't that kind of substantial conflict. You've got one or two parents who are growing apart um, or some other issue that yeah, obviously is pretty consequential for the parent or the parents involved, but from the child's perspective, um, doesn't merit a divorce. And so when you have a low conflict divorce happening, what it tends to do is it tends to be both surprising and devastating for kids who aren't expecting uh, this dramatic break in their lives and also for whom this kind of break can really undercut their faith um, in their capacity to love and to form um, a lifelong marriage uh, down the road. Now, when I first began studying the impact of family structure on kids, my primary concern was divorce and single motherhood. Um, but today, divorce is, uh, frankly, less of a problem for our kids than another innovation. And that innovation is cohabitation. Because today, more kids will see their parents cohabit, either at birth or in the wake of some kind of breakup, than will experience the divorce of their own parents. And what's surprising about cohabitation, because it does involve two adults, is it seems to lead to the same kinds of results that we see in kids who are, who are living in a single parent family as the next um, slide will uh, suggest. So we can see that kids are more likely to be using drugs, they're more likely to be dropping out of high school, and they're more likely to be experiencing psychological problems like depression when they're living in a cohabiting household compared to an intact married family. So given the fact that there are two adults in the picture, what's going on here? What's, you know, what's the story? Well, I think part of the story is revealed also by this uh, slide, which is looking at another set of outcomes, outcomes related to the physical, the sexual, and the emotional abuse of kids. And what we can see here is that the most dangerous place for our kids today is right here in terms of their risk of, of, of physical, sexual, and emotional abuse. And this category um, is where you've got one parent an unrelated partner, typically a mom and an unrelated male boyfriend. It's just that one of the risks associated with cohabitation oftentimes is that it's bringing, once again, an unrelated male into the household um, who himself is less likely to treat um, the kids with proper degree of affection, respect, um, and, and restraint. And if you kind of step back and talk about some of the the other factors that are in play here, what we see basically is that cohabiting unions, as compared to married unions, have less commitment. 
uh, less trust, less sexual fidelity, uh, more violence, and less parental supportiveness. You know, so I think a lot of people see cohabitation as a great opportunity to preserve their freedom and their flexibility in relationships. And there's a certain truth to that. But of course, what they don't realize is the flip side of that is there's less commitment and less trust, less security, um, and all these other things going on in the picture. And that in turn leads to more instability. And if you've ever had kids, or if you've babysat for kids, or if you've taught kids, you know that kids tend to thrive on stable routines with stable caregivers. And that's something that cohabitation doesn't tend to deliver um, to our country's kids. So we can see here, for instance, uh, from one study that uh, in the first five years of a child's life, um, basically the odds of seeing your parents part ways uh, were about three times um, for kids in cohabiting families versus uh, in married families. So all this, in terms of, by way of bringing my discussion about sort of marriage and kids um, and, their, and their welfare to a close, has led a growing number of scholars, um, really across the political and ideological spectrum, to conclude that children are more likely to flourish in intact two-parent uh, uh, married families. Um, and that departures from that present a kind of risk to kids. I have a quote here from Sarah McClanahan at Princeton, um, Ron Haskins at Brookings, and Elizabeth Donahue also at Princeton. Um, Sarah was my mentor at Princeton in graduate school. She's a native Texan. She um, grew up, I think, in the Houston area, was married, divorced, uh, became a single mom, and started studying this whole topic of family structure and kids at the University of Texas at Austin, and then went on to the University of Wisconsin. She's also a very you know, serious-minded person. And her basic idea in studying this was that, look, once we can control for the income effects of single parenthood, we'll probably see most of those negative effects on kids disappear. But the more that she studied this topic, the more that she realized that there was something that was happening that was not just economic. There was an emotional and social side to single parenthood that was impactful for many kids. So it's this kind of research that has led her and her colleagues here to issue this kind of statement. Although it was once possible to believe that the nation's high rates of cohabitation and non marital childbearing represented little more than lifestyle alternatives brought about by the freedom to pursue individual fulfillment, many analysts now believe that these individual choices can be damaging to the children who have no say in them and to the society that enables them. So I've talked so far about the impact of marriage on kids. I want to turn now to thinking about the impact that marriage has on men um, and women. And when you talk about marriage and men and women, I think there are two objections that often surface, both in sort of academic world, in the media, and among ordinary adults. The first idea is that marriage today, and this is sort of a, also a classic idea, I think, that marriage um, has often been seen as a kind of as a ball and chain because marriage represents a kind of a loss of autonomy where you can't always do what you want um, when you want. This is especially an issue, I think, for guys. So one man who we'll call John, um, and who was profiled in a book by Linda Wade and Maggie Gallagher called The Case for Marriage, said this about his, his sort of situation in life. He said, if I weren't married, I'd probably have one hell of a time, unquote, okay? But as we'll see, by surrendering his autonomy, um, this particular gentleman, um, John, actually got something. Because he was also quoted in the book, a little bit later on in the book, saying this. He says, much as I wouldn't want to admit it, I'd probably be lonesome with life. Because I know quite a few guys that got divorced, and what it really comes down to, a lot of them go home at night to a cold home, unquote. Okay, so on the one hand, there's this sort of sense, oh, I lose so much you know, when I get married. But I think on the other hand, sort of on second, you know, uh, on second thought, he realizes that he's got a lot to be thankful for uh, because he is married. A second objection that we hear is that, well, yeah, marriage may benefit men, but it tends to burden uh, women or even hurt women. And this was articulated, I think, quite powerfully by the sociologist Jessie Bernard in her book, The Future of Marriage, 
where she argued that each marriage was really two marriages, his marriage and her marriage. Now Bernard noted correctly that historically women were often treated like slaves or servants by their husbands. And she went on to argue that, you know, even today, men gain in terms of their health, their sense of status and power, um, and their satisfaction from marriage. Whereas women, in her view, got stress, um, dissatisfaction, and experienced a loss of self in connection with being uh, married uh, and a mother um, in, you know, in today's family world. She wrote that wives are, quote, anxious, depressed, and psychologically distressed. She added, we do not clip wings or bind feet, but we do make girls sick. For to be happy in a relationship which imposes so many impediments on her, as traditional marriage does, a woman must be slightly ill mentally, unquote, okay. So we're gonna kind of keep that perspective in mind too as we think about how marriage affects not just men, like John, we heard about a little bit ago, but also just women uh, in general. So first, on sort of the health front, um, what we see when we look at the impact of marriage and health is that men in particular benefit from getting married. And you know, if you were to guess, sort of on average, a guy who, pack, so a guy who smokes a pack a day, how many years, if he starts in his late teens or 20s, how many years is he typically losing um, from his life? Guess? Pardon me? But no, about 10 years, okay? So it's a pretty big effect. And what we see in the research on marriage is that it adds about 10 years to a guy's life um, on average. So you know, one takeaway here you know, is that if you are a smoker and you're a guy, you better get married and stay married. Because <laughs> it'll offset um, the effect of smoking. Um, but of course, the more serious point here is that there is a connection for both uh, women, and especially men, uh, between getting married, staying married, and being more healthy. And women benefit too, but they don't benefit as much as men do um, from the institution of marriage. And you know, what's going on here? Well, um, you know, part of the idea here is that men and women get social and emotional support uh, from their spouses. And we know from some work done by Julie Keichel Glazer, that this kind of support is linked to our, for instance, our immune system functioning more effectively. So having that spousal support um, at a fundamental biological level uh, is good for us. Uh, we also know, too, that our spouses, particularly our wives, tend to sort of monitor and encourage um, good behavior on the part of their spouses, particularly their husbands, okay? And I think here the effect on men is particularly strong because men, as this picture suggests, are more likely than their female peers to engage in risky behavior. So once they get married, they tend to settle down much more than do women. Um, so consider the story of Albert and Lisa, again from the case for marriage. Uh, they met at a party and Lisa says this, quote, he was drunk off his behind and I'm not a drinker. He kept bugging me, he wouldn't leave me alone, unquote. Later he realized he'd have to change his ways if he wanted to court her. She told him she wouldn't date him unless he cut back his drinking and she kept on him after they got married. Albert credits his wife with, quote, straightening me out. Okay. So this story is not all that unusual in some ways, and it may not be as dramatic for you know, many men, but there's something about getting married, both in terms of the institution itself and the advice and counsel, um, and even the nagging of a wife that tends to make men change their behavior. One more concrete example of this is that we see that across the transition to marriage, men tend to um, decrease their attendance at bars and taverns and increase their attendance um, at church. So what about the workplace? So when it comes to men, again, what we see basically is that when men get married, um, they tend to work harder. Uh, my own report with Robert Lerman at the Urban Institute this past fall found that men who are married work about 400 hours more than their equivalent peers uh, who are single. So having the responsibilities of married life, maybe you have some kids in the background, um, the, sort of the obligation, the expectation to be a breadwinner are linked on the part of men to increased work effort. And men don't just work more hours, they work more strategically, they work smarter. What we see, for instance, is that when you look at men 
um, who are married and who are unhappy with their current job, they're much more likely to line up a second job before they quit their first job. By contrast, men who are single are more likely just to quit that first job and then to look around uh, for that second job. And obviously, the, the first strategy is a more successful and more prudent one. We also see, too, that married men are less likely to get fired um, compared to their single peers. This is controlling for a range of different factors. It's not just the fact that they might be more educated, um, for instance. It's something about marriage, per se, that's linked to um, a lower risk, a dramatically lower risk on the part of married men of being fired compared to their single peers. So again, marriage seems to foster a kind of a more strategic or more responsible approach to work um, on the part of men. And all this means that, in part, that men who are married um, make more money than their single peers. About uh, $15,000 um, in their late 20s and about $18,000 um, in their mid 40s. Um, so there's a, a strong connection between, again, between being married for men um, and working harder, working more strategically, and making more money. So when you, when you kind of talk about these kinds of things when it comes to the, uh, the economic arena, the obvious question here, I think, for probably many of us is, well, men may benefit from marriage in the workplace, but what about women? You know, especially given the kinds of claims that Jesse Bernard um, issued about the negative impact in her view that marriage has upon women. Well, it turns out that today, now it wasn't always like this, but that today, marriage exacts no penalty on women's personal income, and of course, furnishes a substantial premium on their family income because they're getting more income from a partner. And what we're seeing today is that the motherhood penalty, which does exist, so women who are moms obviously are less likely to be working full time, and they're less likely to be making, therefore, as much money in part. Um, this penalty is lowest for married moms, who of course are more likely to have a partner in the picture who can help them navigate the challenges of juggling work and family uh, today. So the, the bottom line here is that married women enjoy markedly higher family incomes, and they also actually, of course, enjoy markedly higher family assets compared to their um, single peers and their cohabiting peers, um, even controlling for background characteristics. What about sort of the emotional, the psychological side of things? What do we know um, about this? And recall, of course, that Jesse Bernard said that marriage makes women anxious, depressed, and psychologically distressed. Um, and yet, when we look at the contemporary research on marriage and emotional outcomes, what we find is that both unmarried women um, and men are um, more likely to uh, commit suicide. Um, so marriage is connected to obviously um, a good outcome on this one. They're also um, unhappy uh, with life more often, unmarried women and men, as this slide indicates. They're 50% more likely to report that they are not too happy uh, with life compared to their uh, married peers. So again, marriage is connected to some good emotional outcomes. And then we see in the next slide that when it comes to reports of being very happy with their life overall, um, that both uh, men and women are about 188% um, you know, more likely to report that they're very happy in their lives um, compared to their unmarried peers. So what we're seeing is that marriage is connected to markedly higher odds of reports of global happiness um, among adults today, both women uh, and men. And again, what are the mechanisms? How do we account for uh, these kinds of findings. What's the sort of story here? And again, I think social and emotional support um, are key. I think having a sense that there is someone there for you, um, both now and in the future, is really important. This gives you a kind of a unique sense of meaning in life. Um, and then also, I think, frankly, especially for men, there's a sense of you know status. I'm a married man. I'm a married woman, and that gives me a certain kind of status in my own eyes, in the eyes of my peers my family, my in-laws, that's, that's also valuable. But just to kind of go back to the sort of, the idea of um, a sense of, of support, um, a sense of meaning that marriage may engender among adults today. So we have here Sarah, a middle-aged woman, um, who has this to say about her marriage. Quote, before my father died, we went on a vacation together where we talked and talked. We told each other how much we loved each other. Matt was there with me and for me, always, to get through those terrible things. 
as I was with him when his parents died. So clearly there was a way in which um, that sense of solidarity, that sense of support, that sense of meaning that uh, her marriage engendered in her and Sarah that um, helped in dealing with some of the most difficult things uh, in her life. So another outcome we can think about too is sex. Um, and it is the case that marriage is not, uh, doesn't lead to sort of the, the, the best outcome when it comes to sexual frequency. In that department, cohabiting women and men enjoy the most sex. But when you turn to two different measures of, um, of sexual both behavior and outcomes, I think the story is, a, is, is quite different. So we see that uh, fidelity is a much uh, stronger force um, in the lives of married men than it is in the lives of cohabiting men um, and single men. And of course, even today, um, a clear majority of Americans value fidelity in their relationships. And then we also see when it comes to emotional satisfaction, there's a kind of a ladder, basically, where husbands and wives are more likely to report that they're emotionally satisfied with their sex lives um, compared to their peers who are cohabiting, who are in longer term dating relationships, um, and who are in more short-term relationships. And what's the story here? Well, I think the story is to sort of use that image of a, you know, of a ladder again. There's a kind of ladder of commitment when it comes to sex. And what we see is that kind of more commitment, you know, more security in a relationship is um, linked to satisfaction. Um, it's linked also in part to kind of more opportunities to, to learn about your partner, and to have the motivation to invest in your partner in the sexual arena. So one nurse who had been married for more than a decade had this to say about all this. She said, I think for sex, you need time. Time to know your partner, time to get to know what that other person likes um, or doesn't like. And of course, she, she was expressing the idea that this is more likely to take place in the context of a long-term committed relationship uh, that is uh, in marriage. So in terms of thinking about kind of marriage, uh, men and women, I think it is important to acknowledge that, you know, that on sort of, in some ways in our culture, the negative side of the ledger is that there is less autonomy. Um, there are fewer choice and op options when you get married. You kind of close off, um, you know, some of the opportunities that are out there in, in the social world. Oh, sorry, you missed this. So sorry, this was just the point about the, the most satisfying marriages in terms of, of sex right here, and then cohabitation, longer term, and shorter term relationships. And then this is the point about fidelity, and then sexual frequency by different relationship statuses. And again, so the point here is that marriage is at the top of uh, the commitment ladder. So again, this is sort of potentially the negative side of the ledger for a lot of uh, adults today. But on the positive side, the sacrifices that one makes for marriage uh, bear considerable dividends for men, especially in the health arena and in the income, personal income arena, and for both when it comes to um, their sexual satisfaction um, and to their mental health. And it's for this reason that I think that Jesse Bernard's critique of marriage um, as one that offers more, dramatically more benefits to, to him than to her doesn't um, hold. So the final point that I want to consider is a point that was made uh, once again by Stephanie Kuntz um, in her book on marriage. And her basic idea once again is that as marriages become less stable, and as we've shifted from a fault-based divorce regime to a no fault based divorce regime, as we've kind of stripped many of the protections legally associated with marriage out of our legal system and really out of our culture, um, we've made marriage a much more um, fragile institution, but a more voluntary one, where people are sort of free to stay uh, when they're happy in their marriage, but they're free to leave when they're not happy, or when things are are not going so well. And so from her vantage point, um, this should make marriage better. Or she says, quote, marriage has steadily become more fair, more fulfilling, 
and more effective in fostering the well-being of adults. Well, is she right? Well, she's, she's wrong. <laughs> um, so we can see actually here in the GSS, which is a major um, survey conducted by the University of Chicago, that you know, when the divorce revolution hit, when marriage as an institution became more fragile and more voluntary with less legal protection, what happened to the quality of the average marriage? It went down, especially for women. Okay, so not quite according to her, uh, her plan. And this is particularly striking because over the same period, because of both divorce and people not getting married in the first place, the percentage of adults who are married at any one point in time is falling. And that's, that's surprising because for kind of from her vantage point, you should be getting rid of all those bad marriages and you should just have the cream of the crop, if you will, kind of rising to the top. So you would expect that given this kind of trend here, where fewer people are, are staying married and getting married, that this trend would have been just kind of uniformly positive, not negative. And we look at the share of adults um, in the US who are in a very happy marriage. From the 70s to the present, there's also, once again, a clear decline. So this is, again, this is a mystery because from her vantage point, making marriage kind of more voluntary, stripping it of many of its legal and cultural protections of sort of the, you know, the expectation that it would be permanent, um, you know, should have allowed people to experience um, marriage on their own terms in ways that would only allow kind of the best marriages uh, to survive. But what we saw instead was that not only were there fewer marriages, but there were fewer happy marriages happening here um, in the United States. And I think part of obviously the story here is that as marriage became less stable and as the divorce culture reared its uh, ugly head, um, many ordinary couples in the United States um, who remain married worried at some level that their marriage was vulnerable to divorce. Um, and that kind of fragility tends to be corrosive uh, for fostering a strong marriage. And then also, too, that we, we can see <clears throat> in the next couple of slides that when people have a more provisional attitude uh, towards marriage, when they look at it more as like, I'm going to stay married for so, as long as I am in love, they're less likely to invest practically, emotionally, um, and financially in their spouse and their marriage. And that, of course, does not redound to the, the good of, of their marriages. So to be more precise here, if we look at a sample today um, in the GSS, and we look at um, sort of comparing uh, adults where one set of adults agree that divorce should be more difficult, and one set of adults um, think that divorce in a sense should be easier, what we see is that for both men and for women, the adults who think that divorce should be more difficult are significantly more likely to report that they're very happy in their marriage. Another way to put this, and there, you, know, you can see they're about 50% more likely to report that they're very happy in their marriage. Another way to put this basically is to say that there is a connection between um, looking at marriage as kind of a, a permanent undertaking, having commitment to marital permanency, um, and to enjoying, even today, a, a markedly um, happier uh, marriage uh, in America. So the bottom line here, when we think about um, the effect not just of marriage on you know, kids and men and women, but the effect of kind of a strong marriage culture um, on uh, men and women, uh, both kind of collectively and individually, what we see is that the divorce revolution has exacted a devastating toll on married life in America, where We've seen a trajectory towards lower marital quality um, and fewer marriages in the wake of the divorce revolution, and where markedly fewer American men and women um, are living in very happy marriages. Um, this is sort of not the way it was supposed to turn out. 
in Stephanie Kuntz's uh, estimation or in her prediction. And then even today, the happiest husbands and wives are the ones who embrace that ethic of marital permanence, uh, who embrace this idea that they're together until death um, will do them part. And to sort of put this in a different way, there's no evidence that a weaker marriage culture has made individual marriages on average stronger uh, in this country. So to conclude, what I would like to you know, end um, tonight's um, formal talk um, by saying is, is, is sort of just to make the point that we shouldn't listen uh, to the family Pollyannas in the pop culture, in the academy, and in the media. Because the truth is uh, that marriage still matters, still remains one of the best paths to happiness and to flourishing lives for men, uh, women, and kids in America. And also that couples, communities, and countries really are most likely to enjoy, on average, the happiest marriages when they embrace an ethic of marital permanence um, and reject uh, easy divorce. And to kind of also, just to conclude on a more you know, sort of personal note, I'll kind of give some sort of parting wisdom in my estimation. I think the social science tells us basically that the adventure of marriage is best undertaken um, in and through a community of friends and family that honors uh, and values marriage. And the paradox of contemporary marital and indeed sexual happiness is that such happiness is most likely um, to be found by seeing marriage as an opportunity to make an irrevocable gift of oneself um, to one spouse. Thank you. And if you want more on sort of family matters, we've got a lot of good postings at Family Studies um, Monday through Thursday on you know, any number of topics from parenting to marriage to um, other issues related to the family. And then I'm on Twitter at WilcoxNMP.